I cannot begin to tell you how excited I was the day that Dan called me and asked if I would speak for the two weeks after Easter. I mean, excited doesn't even come close to how I felt on that day and quite honestly how I feel right now being able to talk with you about three of the most important things in life. Upon these principles, we build our lives. In fact, these truths are the foundation of a positive, growing, meaningful relationship. These three biblical truths will either make or break your life. They'll either make or break your relationship, your friendships. They will either make or break your marriage, your family. They'll make or they'll break your company. These three truths, faith, hope, and love. Now, I know you're, you're thinking, I know there's a verse in there somewhere in the Bible that has all three of those words together, and you're right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, these three remain, faith, hope, love. And the greatest of these is love. Now, there are two reasons why that's true. First of all, faith is less than hope, and hope is less than love. Faith and hope are temporary. Love is forever. Faith, we walk by faith, not by sight. That is, we don't see it with our own eyes. We don't feel it with our own hands, but we believe that it's true. The day will come when Jesus returns again and we're going to see him and we're going to be able to feel him and we're going to experience him with no veil between. Right now, he's in the spiritual, we're in the physical, but the physical and the spiritual will be united and will be transformed and glorified and we'll see him as he is and we'll be like him because of that. And so we purify ourselves this very day, 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says. Here's the point. Right now, you live by faith. At that point, you will live by knowledge, by experience. Now, it's not that we don't experience things by faith, but it is that faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. Hope is a part of faith. Hope is a certain expectation that we're going to have things, and in fact, things are going to get better. And the resurrection, when Jesus raises us all from the, dead, the great, from the dead, the greatest miracle ever yet to be performed is going to be whenever Jesus Christ returns and every person who has died will be raised from the dead. All of us who are still alive will also be raised up together with them, floating in the air toward Christ, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, 2 Peter chapter 3 says, we're all going to be floating up together, and 1 Corinthians 15 says we'll all be changed in a twinkling of an eye. It's just like the light reflects off the eyeball. So it is we're going to be changed that fast. Now, I hope all of that is true. I live in a, in a confident expectation that all of that is true, but I haven't experienced it yet. It is not my reality at this point, so it is something I yet hope for. We don't hope for things that we presently have. But when the reality of the resurrection occurs, when the reality of the second coming of Jesus occurs, then we will experience those things and we will no longer hope for those things. Now, the love of God has changed us from inside out. It has radically changed our lives. We are loved by God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is the truth of the matter. God loves you just like you are, period. There is nothing that you add to the love of God. You can't do things to make God love you more. And the opposite of that is also true. You cannot do anything that would make God love you less. For God so loved, put your name there. Put your name there and say that, those words. 
For God so loved Kevin that he gave his only begotten son, that if Kevin believes in him, he shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. He didn't come into this world to condemn Kevin. He came to save Kevin. Now put your name there and make it yours. That is a faith move. Here's what I'm, what I'm really getting to. Faith, hope, and love. Faith is temporary. Hope is temporary. Love is eternal. Faith is will come to an end and it will be our experience. Hope will be realized when the Lord Jesus returns and we experience all that he has promised. We're no longer hoping for them, expecting it to happen. It is now ours. But love, the love that was expressed at the cross and is now experienced by us in heaven with God, that love will never end. And so faith, hope, and love remain now. But the greatest of these is love because it is eternal. It is deeper. It is wider. It is higher. It is longer. The four-dimensional, the multi, 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 extra multi-dimensional love of God now fills our lives because of the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Faith, hope, and love. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is not the only passage that deals with love and faith and hope. In fact, the other way of looking and understanding faith, hope, and love and how dependent they are on each other and how much greater love is than faith and hope is expressed in Romans chapter 4 and 5. Now, Romans chapters four and five, describe faith, hope, and love. But before we arrive in chapter four, page four of this letter, we need to see what he's already written in the first three pages of the letter. And the first thing we realize is Romans chapter one, page one of the letter, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to save for all who believe. Everyone who believes will be saved because of the gospel, the good news. What is the good news? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That is the solid base upon which we build our lives, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is alive, and we're, we're confident of it. But why did all that have to happen? Well, ver chapters 1 through 3 Describe why that has to be true. Both Gentiles and Jews are lost. Why? Well, because we're all sinners. I, no matter how good you are, you'll never be good enough to earn God's relationship, a relationship with Him. No, you're, you're not going to earn it. If you get what you earn, it's going to be total destruction forever and ever. No, 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 no. We don't want what we earn. We want the gift, the gift of eternal life. So Romans chapter 3 summarizes the first three pages of this letter this way. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now notice this. As we look at Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, just about everybody who's listening to me right now, watching me right now, is familiar with that passage. All have sinned. In fact, I, I grew up being beaten by that verse. All have sinned, and you have too, and you're lost, and you don't have a snowball's chance, and you will never get better. And that's how I felt growing up because I, I didn't really hear verse 24. Listen to what the rest of this says. Let Paul Harvey would say the rest of the story. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 still says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Don't get hung up on the word propitiation. It just simply means a sacrifice that takes the heat off. God's wrath was being directed toward us because of our rebellious nature. But Jesus on the cross deflected 
God's wrath. He accepted God's wrath. It came on his own back. You want to know what God thinks about sin? Look at Jesus on the cross, and you'll see the ugly nature of sin and God's hatred of sin and the penalty that must be paid because of sin. Jesus paid that penalty for you. He paid it for you. Your bill has been paid. Justice has been served. And here's but propitiation, the sacrifice that took the heat off through his blood to be received by faith. Now, here's the first principle of faith. Faith is not true. I mean, something is not true because I believe it. I believe it because I'm convinced it's true. But just because I believe something does not make it true. We want our faith resting on truth, on reality. What are the realities of life? Reality number one, God is. God is. That's why his name is I am. Moses says, who should I tell them? Send me when you send me to Egypt to talk to the people and tell them that God has heard your, heard your prayers and he has seen your tears and he sent me to rescue you. Who am I going to tell them you are? They don't know your name. And God said, you tell them I am sent you. I am who I am. And you tell them I am has sent you to rescue you. They'll understand. Well, I'm not sure that they understood then, and I'm not sure that they ever really understood, and I don't know that we understand, but the one thing that I think I do understand about that is this. God always is. God is a present God. And in fact, God is above time. God created time. Time is, has a beginning and it has an end, but God has no beginning and he has no end. He created us within the time elements. With the time had already begun. And so when he created us, we have a beginning, but we have no ending. We are infinite creatures in that God created us like himself. God is. And so God can say, I am. But you know, you and I can say that too. I am. But we can't just say, I am, because we don't have an amness quality to us. We have to have an adjective after that. I am a friend. I am a dad. I am a worker. I am a teacher. I am a preacher. I am. I have to have a qualifier after the I am. God doesn't. God just simply is. Reality number one, God is. God is the creator. He's the creator of all things. And God created the one man and the one woman, and he designed relationship between the man and the woman to form a marriage, to make a family, to be able to bring children into the world. And in that safety of the covenant relationship of marriage, that that family would grow and those children would grow and they too would, a man and a woman, marry and produce children and that the family unit would be the solid foundation of society. God designed it that way. People sinned. Adam and Eve, the first man and woman that God created, sinned. They rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. Therefore, on that day, they died. Now, they didn't die physically on that day. That process began that day, but they did die spiritually on that day. And he, God showed that by driving them out of the garden. But in chapter 4, we see sacrifices taking place where God is calling people back to himself through the sacrifice system. In fact, I believe God gave the first sacrifice system when he clothed them with animal skins. He had to kill the animals in order to get the skin. And so he covered the guilty pair with the clothes or the fur, the, um, <laughs> the, the fur of the animals. He made from the animal skins, he made clothing for them. So the clothing from the innocent covered their guilt. Hmm. God is. God is the creator. God created a man and a woman. Man and a woman sin. Sin came into the world. Through sin came death. And death, physical death, comes to all of us 
Thank you, Mom and Dad, Adam and Eve. But your own spiritual death occurs the day that you sin. And from that day forward, you are separated from God. And that's why Jesus came. He came to become a man he came into this world as a human being. He lived as we live. He slept as we slept, ate as we ate, walked as we walked, talked as we talked, saw what we see. He is a human being, was and is a human being, and he was and is fully God. 100% God, 100% man. This, this is the reality now, because I believe it does not make it true, but it is true, therefore I believe it. I'm persuaded that this is reality. Faith moves us to action. It moves us from one position to another position, from a position of denial to a position of acceptance. And because I believe that all of that is true. Now, it's true whether I believe it or not. If we're you and I are walking down a path together and there's a bear wobbling down the, uh, wobbling or he's coming down the path toward us and I turn and say, a bear! And I start running down the path and you look back and you don't see the bear. You don't believe there's a bear there. You're, you may run anyway because you believe me, but if you don't see it yourself, you don't believe that there's a bear there, you're not gonna be moved to action. But if I see a bear there, I'm going to run. Now, if the bear is there and I run, I'm safe and you don't, you're bear supper. But if the bear is there and you see it and you run, see the reality has moved you to action. God called Abraham. And he said to Abraham, get up and go to a new country I'm going to give to you. And in that country, I'm going to bless you. And blessing you, I will bless you. You and Sarah will have a child, and that child will produce a nation, and you will become the father of many nations. Now, I've just summarized all of the covenant statements of God to Abraham. But Abraham believed God. In fact, one day Abraham said, how do I know for certain I'm going to have all these children? And God says, step outside, look up in the sky, count the stars if you can. And so Abraham began counting and God said, that's how many children you're going to have. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, one of the most powerful statements in the whole Bible, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was written in his book, right with God. God proved to him that he could do what he promised he would do. So Abraham trusted him. He was persuaded. Why? Because he saw the stars. And I'm convinced that he was convinced that anyone who can do that can do this. But he was about 75 years old when God made that promise. And it's 25 years later when God fulfilled that promise. But Abraham did not grow weak in his faith. No, he kept growing stronger. Doesn't mean he didn't have weakness, but he was growing stronger in his faith. Even in moments of weakness and moments of failure, he got back up. He dusted himself off and he continued walking toward God and accepting his promise as his reality. And so Paul says, this is the kind of faith that's going to save you. It's the kind of faith that Abraham chose. This is, this is, uh, this, this, this is so important. Abraham chose to believe. He could have chosen not to believe, but the reality of who God is and what God promised was still there. But because God is, and God did make those promises, Abraham chose to believe, and here's what the Bible says about that. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope 
that he should become the father of many nations? As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith, but he considered his own faith, which was as good as his own body, rather, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, parenthetically, let me add, she was 90 years old and she still hadn't had any children by this time, by 90. No unbelief made him waver. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him as righteousness, were not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be counted to us, watch this, it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from the dead, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. It is that kind of faith that Abraham had that we are called to walk by as well. You say, I don't have that kind of faith. Neither did Abraham when he first took the first step, but he grew in his faith. Neither do you when you first take your first step, but you grow in your faith. It's a journey. It's a marathon. It is not a 100 yard dash. It is a 26 mile marathon. It's going to involve the rest of your life and it's going to grow you. You are going to grow in your faith and your faith is going to grow you. It is that faith then that produces hope. Faith, hope, and love. Now watch how this works. The faith produces hope, but hope is part of faith. Remember Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, I quoted earlier. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. That's right, substance of things hoped for. I don't have it yet in my hands, but I'm still hoping with confident expectation that this is true. Therefore, Romans chapter five, verse one, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, the faith that I've just described to you, Paul says, the faith that's the kind of faith that Abraham says, we believe that God can even raise the dead. And in fact, he did. And that's why we believe that God will do what he promised he would do because God did what God did. God did what he promised he would do then. So I'm confident He's going to do what he says he's going to do. He's going to raise us from the dead as well. We are justified by faith. We're made not guilty by his faith, by faith in him rather. Because of that, we have peace with God. I love that. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Probably one of the best gifts you can have from God is peace, a peaceful relationship with him, isn't it? The relationship with him that is built in love, unconditional love, where he loves you no matter what you've done, where you've slept, where you've been, God loves you unconditionally because he made you and he bought you and he loves you supremely. You're confident in that. So you see, we have peace with God that is built out of his love, we're living in the confident expectation of God's work in our life because we have trust in him. We've been convinced God is faithful. And because of that, we're justified by faith. We have peace with God. At night, you can lay your head on the pillow. Everything is right with God. You can sleep. Look, if you're right with God, what, what does it matter? What else happens in the world and what else happens to us physically? If I'm right with God, I can face anything because I'm not facing it alone. See, you can go through anything in life hand in hand with Jesus. 
You're at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained an access by faith into this grace into which we stand, in which we stand. And we rejoice, watch, in hope of the glory of God. Now we have the glory of God expressed in our life through his Holy Spirit, but not like what we're going to have on the resurrection day and we're going to experience for eternity. We will be glorified and be like Jesus in every respect. And in that respect, he will give to us his glory, complete, full, nothing held back. It will no longer be hoped for, it will be reality. But now we have the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings. See, we're the only ones in the whole world that can do this. Why? Because, let me, let me flow with you. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing we are we know this is true. We perceive this is true. We understand it. We're convinced of it and we live by it. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces, oh, there we are again, hope, hope, hope. The first thing that a minister has to offer to people is hope. The first thing that a doctor has to offer to his patient is hope. The first thing that a psychologist, counselor, therapist must offer to his client or her client is hope. Hope is what keeps us going. Hope is that glimmer of light ahead in a very dark time. And if this world needs anything right now, it needs hope. Your friends and your neighbors and your family need the hope that you have. They need the hope that I have. The hope, the only kind of hope that comes through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and will take our very sufferings, build character in our life, and this character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. It doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. The love of God has been poured into our hearts. That's why we have this hope that is God at work and building our character because you see, nothing can shake the love of God from our lives. Death, life, sickness, disease, famine, spiritual forces of wickedness can't even take the love of God and shake us from it can't snatch us out of his hand. We are solid. We're confident in the hope and the relationship with God because of the love of God. And the love of God is the foundation upon which hope and love are both built. That's another reason why love is greater than these. Now watch. Here's the kind of love that God is revealing through Paul's writings. Stay with me. We're almost finished. While we were still weak, at the time Christ, at the right time, Christ died for us. He died for us in our weakness. We had nothing to offer. How weak were we? <laughs> we were dead. That's how weak we were. That's how weak we are. We're dead. We're separated from God. God is life. He just didn't give life. He is life. When you're separated from God, you're separated from life and love and peace and joy and purpose and meaning, you're separated from everything that gives life any kind of value at all. You may be physically alive, but you're empty inside if you have no relationship with God because God himself is life. While we were still weak, dead, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That'd be us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows this present tense. That is so powerful. See, Jesus died at a point in history that is true. And we can say God demonstrated, God gave his son, past tense. But 
That is such a reality of history that when I embrace that in my life today, that is the current demonstration. That is the future demonstration. That is the perfect, complete demonstration of the love of God because greater love has no one than this except that he would give his life for his friends. And then Jesus said in John chapter 15, where he said those very words, and you are my friends. You are so loved. He values you so much. You're that important to him. You're worth the life of Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody take that away. And don't you do that yourself. Don't call yourself worthless. Don't call yourself a worm. I realize that our, our sin has, has made us broken and we are sinners and that we continue to sin. But listen, that doesn't change your value. Your value is solid. You are worth the life of Jesus and he is that committed to you. He will not give up. He will continue to work with you. You need to reach out and take his hand and hold on to it. He will never let you go. And even if you let him go, even if you turn your back on him, my Jesus keeps pursuing you. He keeps knocking on the door. It was to the church in Revelation there in church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter three, where he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. It was a church full of people who had believed. They had life. They had turned their back on Jesus. They'd become lukewarm, apathetic. They had walked a meaningless, hopeless existence for a period of time. And Jesus said, I'm knocking at your door. I want to come back in. I want to have supper with you like friend with friend. Will you please let me back into your life? And Jesus invites us into a supper kind of relationship with him. And you eat supper with your friends. God shows his love and I want you to hear from that value and commitment. God shows how extremely valuable you are and how committed he is to you in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yet since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Propitiation, right? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. This is resurrection week after. We are the week after we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. I know, I know, you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every week when you take communion. You celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every day when you get out of bed and you recognize you're cognizant of the presence of God and you talk with him throughout the day. I know you celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on a daily basis, but this says that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus is a living Savior, and this is how we continue to live our relationship with Him through faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled, well, I'm sorry, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by His death, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Look, I wish that you and I could just sit over a cup of coffee and talk about this a lot more. In fact, feel free to give me a call. My number is 208-283-9599. Text me, set up a time, let's talk on the phone. We can do some FaceTime together, Skype together, Zoom together. I don't care how we do it. I'd love to see you. I'd love to talk with you face to face, or at least over the phone. Or further removed, we can text each other. But if you would, let's just keep this conversation going, okay? I wanna to give to you these three things because these three things will build your life forever into a life that is worth living and a life that you will enjoy 
throughout all of eternity. Faith, unshakable dependence on God, no matter what the circumstances are. Hope, a confident expectation that everything is going to be better, especially at the second coming when Jesus returns and makes everything better. And love, the foundation upon which faith and hope are both built and will continue on forever because you see, God is love and God will never stop loving you. And that's the truth.